Uh, I did feel that there was something sinister, strange, unusual about the whole thing. In 2007, the most comprehensive study of the Barney and Betty Hill abduction case was undertaken by authors Kathleen Marden and Stanton Friedman. The result was the nonfiction book, Captured. Kathleen has spent years studying the evidence surrounding her aunt and uncle's fantastic story. As a social scientist, the mystery was one she had no choice but to follow. I had a very good background as a social scientist and as Betty's niece, so I had first-hand knowledge of the case. Betty was almost a mother to Kathleen, she was a role model in a close way that there wasn't anybody else that had the same close relationship with Betty. My aunt Betty was a social worker for the state of New Hampshire. My uncle Barney worked for the post office. Betty and Barney Hill were prominent in their local community in Portsmouth. I had met Betty and Barney in 1968 in Pittsburgh. I didn't know what to expect. I mean, here, this is a very sensational story after all. They were very credible people and also they had a good reputation. I mean, these people were the salt of the earth, you know. Uh, and so their credibility, I think, is just outstanding. Yeah, very simply, I believe their experience was real. I had doubts about whether or not it was a physical abduction because no one had ever been abducted by a UFO as far as we knew. It's the first abduction case to be taken seriously and reported openly. It's a milestone in ufological history. It encouraged other people to come forward for hundreds of years, strange saucer-shaped objects have been seen in the sky, but it was not until 1964 that the first public disclosure of alien abductions was made. The story would capture the attention of the world and inspire thousands to come forward in the decades to come. I didn't believe them at first, but and I saw how much it affected Bonnie. You know, he, he became an alcoholic over it. Uh, you know, it just really affected him emotionally that I realized, yes, something did happen because both of their, uh, you know, their mental beings just changed. They turned into different people. Bonnie was turned into uh, a very scared individual. For me personally, I felt that perhaps it would have been easier if I could have said this was a fantasy and my aunt and uncle simply made a mistake. Then my family could just go on living, but I couldn't do that. I wanted to find out for myself if Betty and Barney had actually been abducted or if they had uh, created and absorbed a fantasy that they retold through hypnosis. Stanton Friedman is uh, a nuclear physicist and scientific ufologist, probably the best known in the world. I shoot hard. I, I, I'm not a, an apologist ufologist. I tell it like it is. I have a low tolerance for stupidity. I mean, there's still people who think the world is flat. You know, there's a flat Earth society. <laughs> uh, and there are still some people who believe we haven't been to the moon. I know that the public is ready, willing, and able to listen to factual information. Kathy knew that I had been involved early on, so it seemed a natural thing to get together and to rebut the many stupid arguments that were being made and help validate the Hill case. Betty and Barney observed the craft right in front of this mountain to the, the west of us. Kathy and Stanton returned to the White Mountains, retracing the journey that the Hills described under hypnosis and discussing the case with some of the early investigators. He said the Air Force is keeping secrets. Remember, he was a member of MJ Mel, Project Blue Book, Special Report 14. We continued driving south, and my wife would occasionally remark that this object was still following us. And finally, my wife became very upset. She said, look, right overhead. And this object now was very extremely close 
So I came to a complete stop, got out of the car, and I took the binoculars, began walking across the highway, looking up at the object with the binoculars, putting them down, shaking my head, saying, well, this just can't be true. I don't believe it. After we arrived home, well, we decided we wouldn't mention this to anyone, that it was too ridiculous, too absurd <laughs> for us to believe. They realized that they had arrived home in Portsmouth later than anticipated. They actually had arrived at daybreak. Betty and Barty were obviously disturbed when they got home. They weren't quite sure why. Something strange had happened. And there are several peculiarities that they took note of. Uh, one was Barney's shoes were badly scuffed. Betty's dress was torn from waist to hemline on the right side. Their watches had stopped. Now, that sounds like a trivial thing, but when both watches stopped... Several days after the UFO encounter, Betty had a series of dreams or nightmares about an abduction by aliens in this UFO. The hills would be haunted by the UFO encounter and two hours of missing time for more than two years. Betty's nightmares persisted, and Barney began to develop debilitating health problems. I do believe that Barney was experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder. He had all of the symptoms. Desperate to recover their memories of what happened in those two hours of missing time, the Hills began to seek help. In November of 1962, at the rectory of the Unitarian Church in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, this couple came up to me and they told me their story and then they had this blank spot in their memories and asked if hypnosis was useful to recover lost periods of memory. And I said, yes, that's one of the classical uses of clinical hypnosis. They needed to find a competent psychologist or psychiatrist who used hypnotherapy. Betty and Barney were referred to Dr. Benjamin Simon, and in February of 1964, Barney had his first hypnotic regression. This isn't a parlor hypnotist. This is a man who had treated thousands, literally, of shell shock war veterans from World War II. And his expertise was in breaking through the barriers to recovering repressed memories. Yes, go on. You remember it now? You are distressed, but you will remember everything, and you will tell me everything. Yes. Get lights off the bed of the road. Men in the road. <laughs> I've never been so afraid in my life. Tell me about the men in the room. These men started to come up to the car, and they opened the car door. There's a couple of men behind me, and then there's Barney, and there's a man on each side of him. And my eyes are open. My body's still asleep. He's walking, and he's asleep. Barney. <laughs> The terrifying story that would unravel during the hypnosis sessions has since become familiar. Experiencing some form of telepathic mind control, the hills are taken aboard a craft and examined as specimens. Unusual medical instruments are used to perform painful procedures. The couple then have their memories erased. As night falls, Kathy and Stanton arrive at the abduction site only days after the 47th anniversary of the event. When Stan and I were beginning our interview, you drew our attention to something behind us in the sky. Motors running on two vehicles. What do we have here? Obviously what happened last night was a little bizarre. I wanted to show you guys the footage and uh, get your reactions to it now. Example. Even with the motors running on two vehicles. Yeah. What do we have here? Well, that's rather interesting. <laughs> I mean, we're out in the middle of nowhere here. That's really nowhere. I don't know what to make of it. I've never seen anything move like that. 
you know, and, and it matches the description that we heard last night from, from other people who observed this. Yeah. For some reason, New Hampshire does seem to be a state that has had a lot of UFO activity. As they're taking me up to the object. I go up the ramp. I don't want to go on it. Although Dr. Simon conducted the session separately and induced amnesia at the end of each session, Betty and Barney's stories of the abduction match to the smallest detail. Of course, the, the thing that stands out in my mind is Barney when he's looking through the binoculars and he sees the craft hovering over the ground. I mean, that poor man was shook up. Um, you knew he was just terrified. The psychiatrist had given them the audio tapes to take home and listen to them, thinking that might help reduce the trauma. But they didn't want to listen to them alone. Just before the point on the tape where Barney starts screaming, I gotta get out of here, and runs back to his car, the physical Barney jumped up and ran out in our kitchen and vomited in our sink. And I thought that would be pretty hard to fake. I try to maintain control so Betty cannot tell I am scared. God, I'm scared. It's all right. I got to get my gun. Oh. I got to get my gun. All right. Oh. All right. That's all right. I got to get my gun. Perhaps the most intriguing evidence to emerge from the hypnosis is Betty's simple drawing of a map, which she understood to be the home of the alien beings. Astronomer Marjorie Fish spent years constructing three-dimensional models of known star configurations, attempting to identify and authenticate the map. Because here's Betty, who had no background in astronomy and that kind of thing, and, and uh, she draws this map and nobody can tell where it goes. Marjorie Fish tries to put it into a, uh, a, a normal star configuration that, that she could find, nothing matches. And lo and behold, when our astronomers find these two stars, they put it in the star catalog and bingo, perfect. That's exactly what Betty drew. Well, how did she do that? Years before it was even into the catalog. You know, that to me is, is very telling, I think. That's pretty convincing evidence. Yeah, I mean, you know, how do you fight that? You can't, you know, I, how could she know? Chemist Phyllis Budinger has performed a detailed chemical analysis of unusual stains on the dress Betty wore the night of the abduction. The stains are all that remain on areas of the dress that were once covered in a strange pink substance where the beings touched the dress. Phyllis Budinger is a world-class chemist. Phyllis cut swaths from the dress and uh, took them to her laboratory in Chagrin Falls, Ohio, and analyzed them over uh, a two-year period. I found that there was a, a protein-type substance which I could relate to mold, but the fact that on all the stain samples it was on the outside shows that this did not come from Betty. This was a secondary product, uh, obviously mold that had grown on something that had been there previously and possibly from the abduction. And we can uh, see that right here. Yeah, yeah, and especially here. Yeah, oh yes, right see there here? as well. Yeah. In some ways, uh, the speculation would support Betty's story. Whoever heard of a film company filming two ufologists <laughs> on a UFO <laughs> show? <laughs> no, it did not look like stars. Okay. It looked like one dot, another one, like this, and then they disappeared, 
and then one showed up and this one disappeared another one showed up this one disappeared and it just repeated itself and they were like a light bulb color like a tint of yellow and another one of our servers saw something like this a couple days ago too oh in the same area so what's happening in new hampshire <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we definitely saw that. <laughs> Where is this? The AAA road. So creepy. That's what we That is exactly what we thought. <laughs> I'm not going to call it alien. It was something strange. Betty and Barney had always intended for their UFO sighting and then their abduction to remain confidential. They didn't need negative publicity in their life. And coming forward with this, what I thought was very brave of them to do. UFOs were not considered a very highbrow topic, to say the least at that time. They expected to lose their jobs. And Barney was very active in civil rights, of course, and he, the last thing he needed was some silly story about flying saucers. They had told only a few scientists, and, and the material was to be handled as confidential material. After the truth was revealed through a violation of confidentiality, Betty and Barney agreed to talk publicly for the first time. John Fuller, an author and UFO researcher, convinced them to tell the true story of their experience. The book became a New York Times bestseller. It was published in several different languages. They were actually surprised to find that uh, it was more widely accepted than they anticipated it would be. Betty and Barney achieved quite, quite a degree of fame, fame that they never sought. After Barney died, Betty devoted more of her time to UFO research and UFO investigation and did seem to have later encounters. This is a photograph that Betty took of a craft that she said was hovering above her vehicle. And uh, you can see that it appears to be saucer-shaped. And uh, there's something in the window there. And there seems to be evidence that UFOs actually did land on my grandparents' farm. This was the goat house. <laughs> I can remember in the middle of the night hearing this huge bang that actually knocked me out of bed. So my brother and I went down in the field and we, we found this area that all the trees were sheared off about probably 20 feet up and there was a huge triangle imp imprint in the ground. And I can remember my brother reached down and grabbed some uh, white birch bark that was all curled up and singed and when he grabbed it he went ah and like he burnt his hand. My grandparents house rattled and they got up looked out of the window and did see like a huge glowing moon outside. So there does seem to actually be some kind of connection bizarre as it is between Betty and these later sightings. We can no longer say that this was a fantasy. Here we have evidence that it was an actual physical experience. I have picked up the torch and continued Betty's fight because I think that her credibility is worth defending. I don't think that I have inherited any ability to um, contact UFOs through Betty and I think that what happened in the White Mountains uh, a few nights ago was mere coincidence. I don't think that it had anything to do with my presence. <laughs>